Welcome to the Three Knockdown Rule. Starring Mario Lopez and Steve Kim. Presented by Hustler Casino and UFC Fight Pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule is in effect. Brought to you by UFC Fight Pass. I'm Steve Kim, joined by my co-host, Hollywood Stario Lopez. Oh, oh I got gosh. deep into the bag on that one. We'll oh talk about that a God. little later, but congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. We've got a lot to talk <laughs> about. The bout sheet for today, PB Canelo. We take a look at the, the Zone and Showtime cards, and we talk to Antonio Tarver on the championship hotline. And we have Ask Mario and Final Flurries, but a word from our fine sponsors. We want to let you know the three knockdown rule is brought to you by the Hustler Casino. It's our favorite local L.A. casino, poker to pie gal, and home of the most popular poker live stream in the world a Southern California staple since the year 2000. Also, shout out to our sponsor and neighbor right here in Hollywood, Oscar Lopez, no relation, from Scalp Micro LA. Oscar's been hooking it up. It's a company that offers a unique and innovative hair loss solution for men. So you all out there thin and listen up. Scalp micropigmentation, which is known as SMP, is a state-of-the-art restoration service that replicates the exact shape and size of hair follicles by tattooing, yes, tattooing, tiny particles of pigment into the scalp, giving the illusion of hair. And you can see results in as little as one treatment. It can create and restore complete hairline. It can give density to the appearance of thin hair. I've seen it up close. Actually, it's really good, especially if you're rocking a close cropped hairstyle. Uh, also, by the way, good for camouflaging burns or other skin conditions. They use the highest quality uh, for its procedures. So if you're going bald or just looking for a new look this summer, call our homies over at Scalp Micro LA and mention this ad for a free consultation. Because if you're getting thin... We'll help fill you in. All right, anyway, let's begin. Round one. Big news, Mario. Late last week, the immediate future of Saul Canelo Alvarez. People were wondering what's he going to do to kind of close out the sunset of what's been a glor glorious, magnificent career. And it was announced late last week, Canelo has signed a three-fight deal with Premier Boxing Champions. And it looks like September 16th, it'll kick off against Jamal Charlo most likely in Las Vegas. I, I'm i surprised by the number of fights. I thought Canelo um, would be more of a case-by-case -case person at this point uh, in his career. And it looked like a big uh, love fest with, with Eddie Hearn when he sort of had that union. And I don't know exactly uh, uh, what happened there, but he is a businessman. And I, I wouldn't say he's in the twilight of his career, but he's in the back nine. I think, if you will, and he's also made enough money and he's a big enough star to where he can literally pick and choose his, his battles. I'm not mad at the Charlo fight at all. I know some people are like, oh, they would love to see Benavides. Of course, I would love to see Benavides fight uh, next. But um, Charlo, who hasn't fought in a long time, is still a dangerous guy. And I think visually, it still looks like a really good fight stylistically. I still like the matchup. But I'm surprised by the number of fights and... I don't know too much of the backstory while I was looking forward to getting your thoughts on uh, a little bit of the history. I think you got to give Canelo credit because he has proven he will go where the fights are. We have to be honest. PBC, if you take a look at their roster from both Charlos to David Benavidez, maybe to an Errol Spence that's been talked about and mm. a dangerous David Morrell, even a Demetrius Boo Boo Andre, I would much rather see these fights. And then Edgar Berlanga, who we'll talk about in a few minutes. I agree, but at the same time, he was pretty high on Bivol for a minute, but I guess I just sort of went, <laughs> well, was he? Wasn't he not? And I guess I just uh. sort of went by the wayside. That's why I was a little surprised it wasn't a case-by-case. -case. You're right. If he plans that little uh, uh, the murderer's row right there, which I think is pretty impressive, if he's able to, in a perfect world, go from Charlo to, say, a Benavides to, say, Spence, Right, that's a nice little three fight. Uh, yeah, it is row right there. But for a while there, we were hearing a lot of Bivol, but maybe it just, you know what Bivol is just sort of set in. Uh, Bell Biv Bivol, he's poison. 
I, I, no, we said this, but he was I still mean, calling him out, and I agree. So that's why I was just sort of pr- a lot of grandstanding, Mario. Yeah, I, a lot. Of, no, but he's a stubborn guy, so I'm surprised that he didn't mm. still want to make him go down to 68. I actually thought he was going to yeah. try to make Bivol go down to 68. Uh, to be honest, about a month ago, I, I tried to warn Bivol's people, "You're not getting this fight." I, I was told by a pretty good source. They're like, "No, we've tried it. We've done it. Let's look at other avenues." Mm. Now the question becomes, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. The crown jewel fight in terms of a fan, in terms of business, is Benavides. Mm-hmm. So now if you're Benavides and you're going to wait around and you're going to say to yourself, wait a minute, we're certain fights we like, it's going to keep us the status. Mm-hmm. We're going to have that belt. We're going to be undefeated. So certain guys are not going to get the fight. And we'll talk about that later. So, so do you take Morel on next if uh, you're Benavides? I wouldn't, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. Yeah. But talk about the time frame. It'll go by relatively quickly because think about it. We're already going to be into September by the time you know it. He's going to fight next Cinco de Mayo of 24, then September. And at that point, I think he'll only be 33 or 34. Wow, but a lot of tread on A lot of tires. tread. He'll of have tre- over 65 professional bouts. Yeah, and he's had some surgeries, keep in mind. So he's been full throttle um, with the sports car physique of his for, for a while. So uh, and like I said, you know, I love me some Canelo. I love that the challenges he takes on. But the body, he has been very active, especially for this day and age. So a lot of that wear and tear, I think... The longer he puts off Benavides, the more dangerous it gets for him. You yeah, because there's more miles on the odometer and a kid that's ascending. Exactly. As for Charlo, his speed and quickness, he's the smaller guy right now. He's very athletic. Will trouble him early. But like I said, it's a mantra of mine. Activity matters. I think he starts to time him and he starts to grind him and wears him down late. But again, anything can happen. It's a fun fight. But it looks like that fight will happen in September. And real quickly here on The Zone this past weekend from the theater at Madison Square Garden, Edgar Berlanga goes to 21-0, and scores a 12-round decision on his way to knocking down Jason Quigley four times. Mario, I'll say this. Even though he didn't score a knockout again, I thought this fight was an improvement over the last three or four previous. You know, so yeah, he did knock him down four times, and then maybe I'm grading too hard because he came out of the gate so strong, and he was such a shining star with so much momentum, and maybe we're judging him a little too harshly, but my guy got caught with some really clean shots throughout the fight, too, and I still feel he's stagnated in his development, and I don't know if that's with his trainer, I don't know if it's just he's hit his peak, or I don't know if he needs a new change of scenery, but I feel he did look better, but at at the same time, I felt, especially after the second knockdown, he could have maybe, a, a, a fighter who had maybe improved and learned to close the show, he should he could have had him out of there. But I don't like the way he received some of those shots, Ken. And it was, it was I was encouraged and discouraged at the same time, if that makes any sense. Now, I know on the heels of that, he was starting to count out a lot of big names. And then I thought to myself, I don't know if I favor him at all with those any of those big names that he's uh, wanting to, to, to call out. And then how much was made with... Him siding with Eddie Hearn and then Canelo because they're promising yeah. him the fight allegedly with Canelo um, or teasing him with that and then Canelo uh, uh, crossing the, f- the street. But again, it goes back to what I said this last week. More than ever, I want to see the fight with him and Jaime Munguia now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on with Eddie Hearn and Oscar De La Hoya. That's an- uh, I'm going to call them the butchers because they got beef. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you do Munguia, Berlanga. Co-feature should be Hearn against De La Hoya. Well, Put that, that on pay-per-view. Well, yeah, but the, the irony is because of that beef, they may not want to work with each other to get this fight <sighs> made, oh which God. which sucks. But I think both guys need a legitimate test or yep. something that sells. One thing about Berlanga, at least in this fight, because I, what I noticed in his last couple of fights with top rank, if he didn't get the early knockouts and he ran out of ideas, he would just lay back. Mm-hmm. At least in this fight, he was still trying to get his way and work his way towards a knockout, and he scored two knockdowns in the 12th round. But he does need to humble himself a little bit. But Mario, you're right. That 16 fight first round knockout streak was the best and worst thing that ever happened to him. Great thing is he was in a lot of highlights. He was getting people excited. The problem is no seasoning whatsoever. And you could see the holes in his game and you can only get that through live action. Yeah, and also I I, I guess he, he may have improved, but I still feel he gets a little frustrated if he's not able to at least hurt you early and feel like he's gotten in your head. I, I, there's still layers that he needs to work on to his game and adjustments that need to be made. And I think through activity, maybe that'll come. But I would pump the brakes on some of the names that he's been uh, dropping. It looks like he get back, got back on the right track. 
but I don't know if he's ready for all those big dogs yet. All right, gun to head. If they fought in four to five months, Mungia Berlanga, who do you favor? I really like that fight. And I think, listen, the thing about Mungia is that he loves himself a firefight too. And Berlanga is dangerous and can crack And he early. can bang though. He's yeah. never faced a guy quite like this. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But Mungia has shown good whiskers too. Again, he hasn't faced guys like that, but he has shown good whiskers. Berlanga does get cracked too, so it's really injury. Gun to head, I'm leaning towards Mungia because I think he's got a little more tools in his in his uh, uh, skill set there. But, you know, it's an exciting fight that I would not be surprised if Berlanga is able to catch him. All what right. about you? Uh, I would say Mungia is a little bit more of the seasoned, hardened guy, and I know a little bit more about his chin. But there's a reason why you fight the fights. Right, we come back. On the three knockdown rule, a word from our sponsors, and we go to the magic man, Antonio Tarver. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. $1.2 million. (laughs) And I'm losing in this fucking game. What the fuck? This is a 400k flip. If I win by the way, you get 10 grand. All in in a call. I'm not fucking leaving. Raise it up. All right, joining us right now on the championship hotline on the three knockdown rule presented by UFC Fight Pass. Mario, one of the most colorful, one of the most engaging and intelligent boxing guys and a former world champion. Oh, always known for being outspoken. The magic man, Antonio My, Tarver. The magic man. Antonio, what's going on? Good. brother? been a minute. So good to see you. Nice to see you too, my guy. Appreciate it. Uh, Tony, let's get into this before we talk about other things. I know this past weekend there was some boxing that we all watched. You were a fighter. You gave punches. You took punches. You've been in that ring. You know the dangers of it. Did you agree or disagree with the stoppage in the fight between Carlos Adamas and Julian Williams? Uh, at, At the moment of the stoppage, I mean... It didn't look like Julian was letting his hands go in return uh, for a good period of time. He took some brutal shots. Um, The fight was somewhat close, but you can't fault the referee at that time for for really stopping that fight, man. It just, it looked like the fight was, you know, taken out of Julian at that time. And uh, rather, you know, he had weathered the storm in earlier rounds. It, It just didn't look like, you know, that he was going to go on to probably find that knockout punch or or land that shot. I, I thought he was hurt bad enough where the referee was justified in stopping it, even though the fight was in the balance at the time. I, I agree with you because that was a t- – and then in retrospect, it's always easy to sort of kind of maybe second guess, well, he did answer. But no, I thought the, the, uh, uh, the amount of punishment he was taking and it was sort of almost a reactionary – punches that he was throwing not that they had any sort of bad intentions or might have done damage to to swing the fight so, so i agree with you that i thought the um uh the ref was not was not at fault there by the way i want to point out aside from the accolades that um antonio tarver has uh, achieved as a professional too not many fighters are able to transition and to articulate and be great in the broadcasting booth and you my friend are one of them you've done a great job and you've been able to 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 really um See to to, to uh, explain what you're saying and to give some insider's point of view. So it, it's always a pleasure to kind of get your take on that because for some reason that's difficult for a lot of guys. Thank you, appreciate it. And yeah. speaking of that, Antonio, you were right there on the front lines. I mean, literally on the front lines, reporting on Mayweather Gotti that situation a couple of weeks ago at the FLA Live Arena in Sunrise, Florida. And this is what I love: all the footage that took place in the aftermath, it went viral and. I didn't realize it was Tarver. It was, it was Tarver. Saying, I, go, oh, I yeah. said, you're doing play-by-play I mean, and shooting one-man crew right I there. Mean, Antonio, did you feel like Wolf Blitzer or Walter Cronkite on the front lines? I, I mean, I, what was the whole situation like? But wait, and what started it, yeah. Antonio? Like, what happened? Hey, you know what? I was I was actually going live with my fans, man, to try to tell them about the melee I had just witnessed with the aftermath of uh, the Mayweather Gotti fallout. And lo and behold, I go in the back and I'm still live. And here's a, a, a free fall, man. It was crazy. But um, I just didn't want to definitely didn't want to put my hands on no one. I don't condone women fighting outside of the boxing ring at all. You know, you can really take out your differences. And then, 
you know, no one has to go to jail. No one has to get no charges filed. So if you really have that type of beef out there, there's enough, you know, uh, celebrity boxing going on where, you know, there's a platform for that now. You feel me? So, uh, and from what I saw, that would have been a hell of a fight. You feel me? Especially in the ring. Yo, that one girl was like Jocelyn Hernandez. Yo, yo, she was ready. To, man, I, I think she, she was wrecking house right there. But what was the the genesis no, no, no. of that? They were on a, uh, the, I was told that they were on a reality show a while back. Oh, so they had and it carried over, and it just kept, okay. Got it. That's, I was like, so, damn, that's yeah. a lot of animosity for just one night. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want people to think that that was just some isolated incident that, you know, we frequently have at boxing events. That's yeah. that's not they had they had some personal beef. It was some things that carried over. I had uh, later found out that Big Lex, the young lady that was uh, in the fight with Hernandez, she had been sending out, you know, shots talking about it's on site. I, I got a security for your security. And oh, so damn. It was, Threats. There were some threats made. Oh, so there was a lot. There was a big backstory. Yeah. Okay, well, we're not aware of. Well, look, I, okay. I talked to some people that worked that event, and it's interesting because Beto Duran and there was another lady that worked it. I forgot her name. Um, and they just got out of there. They were told by the producers when that thing broke out. Got, but obviously, uh, Antonio has the pass. He could stick around, kind of report live on the scene. Uh, Antonio, I was told that one of the issues was on that night, there were a lot of credentials but not a lot of security. That is always a recipe for disaster. Mm. Throughout the night, could you see that something was brewing? I didn't. Only thing was it, I, that I thought was kind of different. There was so many people in Mayweather's in the camp, like in the in the in the dressing room area. It was just you know like a big pre party. You know, not that it was anything wrong with that, but all those people walk the champ to the ring. Everyone wanted to be a part of this big exhibition. But when all those people walked him in the ring and up to the ring, where were those people going to sit? So the fight didn't get started to about 15 or 20 minutes after they got in the ring. But still, everyone just gathered around ringside. There was really, I don't know how security could have even handled that many people. But I think looking back, if it was in a, if it was carried or if it was looked at as a real fight, the commission wouldn't have had nobody back in Floyd's dressing room. Dressing room. It's only four people allowed in the dressing room yeah. when you're going by the rules and you're going by the book. But when it's an exhibition fight, oh, okay, God. all the rules and regulation goes out. Yeah. So yeah. I think they're going to have to start especially when it's a Mayweather exhibition. That's not like any other fight. That's not, that could even compete with some of the biggest fights, even now. You feel me? Because he just draw that much attention, especially when, when he's in cities like Miami. So it was a lot, it was star studded. The promotion was grand. And, and I think when you look at the brands, the Gotti brand and the Mayweather brand, two of the biggest brands out there, it was tension. It was tension even from the weigh-in, bro. And I don't know where that came from, but it was a lot of tension. So thick you could cut it with a knife. I didn't know that was going to happen. but And I was surprised Gotti didn't start fighting until the fight was called off. I mean, you had six rounds to do what you wanted to do. I know. Express yourself. You know, now that the fight I, is weighed off, now you want to start fighting? You I was, do your best combination of the fight after it was right, weighed off, man. That was funny to me. I was going to mention that. I'm like, is it just me or did this fool just start fighting? Like once the fight was called, I, it blows <laughs> me away that guys like him or other guys in like this. I heard one of the Paul brothers talking about he can take Tyson now. It's like, these guys have no like, like you really I don't know if they're they're just delusional or if they really think they can handle these pro professional fighters or former professional fighters. It just it just blows me away. Well, <laughs> it, it blows me away. But uh, speaking of uh, of Mayweather, you, uh, of course, have known him for a long time because you were on the Olympic team with him and Fernando Vargas back in, in 96. Man, how things have changed for yeah. you all so, since then. But what do you remember about that time with those guys? You know what? Um, I remember that all these guys, we we all felt that we were going to go on and do something great in the game of boxing. You feel me? I think that 
the team that we gathered in 96 was a special team. I think that uh, when you look at the energy we brought and, and how we went on as pros to have some of the biggest careers and some of the biggest nights, uh, I, I don't, I'm not surprised, you know, that that team was as successful as we were. You know, we had a lot of great dynamics surrounding that team. And uh, when you when you can produce, you know, guys like Floyd Mayweather, Fernando Vargas, Eric Morrell, uh, uh, David uh, Reed, and, and just to name a few, myself, I mean, hey, what can you say? I think arguably you have to, you know, say that we're one of the best Olympic teams that ever assembled. Uh, when you look at how many championships we won as a mm-hmm. as a uh, I think we did. We arguably, you can put us up there with with the best. Antonio, obviously Floyd went on to become an all-time great. Was there a particular moment in the gym or at a tournament where you said, man, that guy's special, like he's different? I mean, uh, you knew that. Um, even when we first met in the uh, PAL championships where we both won and Floyd was named the uh, most most outstanding boxer. Uh, that was, uh, I think, in 94. It could have been 94. Uh, it was my first time seeing him. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, he was representing then, even before the Vegas. And uh, uh, he was a special athlete. You could see that. He had the technique, the skill set. I mean, but like I said, that team was gifted, very talented. You know, um, Eric Morrell was was one of the guys that uh, – I'm sorry, uh, uh, the 106 pounder, I believe, yeah was a, a very talented fighter. Zahir Raheem, mm-hmm. uh, guy from Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had six guys that won bronze medals, but I think on any given night, you could say, you know, half of us got robbed in the Olympics. So we could have brought home two or three gold medals, two or three more. You know, I know I was favored to win. I had just beat Vasily Jirov four months prior. And when you look back at that fight, a lot of people argue that shit. I got robbed in the, in the, in the games, but – you know, that's water under the bridge. You, you, We move on. But I think as professionals and, you know, as, my, as successful as my career was, I think it, it shows who was the best fighter. I Antonio, mean, really, uh, here's a question. How fiery was a young Fernando Vargas in 1996? <laughs> <laughs> hey, he was about as, um, you know, fiery as any uh, ferocious. He was ferocious in everything. You know, that's how he approached the game. You know, he really felt that, you know, if it came down to heart, wasn't nobody beating him. You feel me? He felt like he had enough of that type of uh, gall that if it came down to a heart check, he was going to make that other guy fold, you know, and he, he approached it like that. Entertaining, you know, all his fights, even when in defeat, he was very entertaining. I don't think he ever had a, a boring fight. So uh, Fernando's one of those guys and he, he got it young. I mean, when you look at some of the young guys, I think shit, he was a champion at 22, 21 years old. The youngest, I, youngest junior middleweight junior champion middleweight. ever at age 20 or 21, I believe. Yeah, he was yeah. Cut, cut too. Now he's got three of his sons and one very, very mm-hmm. talented son. Uh, and Emiliano that's doing really well, but all three of them there. So it's nice to see him as a family man too. I want to uh, just pick your, your brain on one particular fight. Big one, that course that's coming up around the corner, Antonio, your thoughts on Spence Crawford. You know what? I, I, I'm a Crawford fan. I like Crawford for, you know, all the things that he can do in the ring. But I can tell you, man, uh, the Spence that showed up for the pressure was refreshing and was surprising. He really came out of the shell. And I like, man, that how candid he was, even in it with the sound bites, you know, his one liners and the things that he was saying. You can see that he's a very engaging champion. And I think that we wish that. A more this would have been on the surface, but hey, this type of fight, a super fight with one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world, it brings that beast to the surface, man. And if you don't know that what we're in for is is for a very, I think, historical night in boxing with everything being on the line. And when you see both of these guys' energy, I don't think any one of these fighters are going to back down. And I can think, I can see this fight starting hot early and mm-hmm. end early in one of those fashions that we saw Hagler and Hearns. And we don't know who's going to be Hagler and we don't know who's going to be Hearns. But I can guarantee you we're going to have that type of explosion on, uh, you know, July 29th, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, 
this man right here, Antonio Tarver, is no stranger to big fights. Mario, I want to go back a little bit as I preface this question. I'll never forget the night Roy Jones beats John Ruiz to make history to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And everyone is out there on the throne kissing the ring. And I'm at the press conference and we're all milling around. People are asking questions. All of a sudden, to my left, I see Antonio saying, excuse me, give me the mic. I'm like, oh, Tony wants to ask a question. And here I'm thinking he's going to congratulate him. And he flat out basically, hey, Roy, Roy, you've been running from me. I'm sick of this. When are you going to give me my shot? You've been ducking. To he did the clubber lane at the, at the statue ceremony. for. I was like, wow. And I remember Roy was kind of insulted. Do you get that fight if you don't do that that night? I don't think so. Not at all. Uh, I think that night, um, even though I think people knew me, I think they had to really recognize me that night because I wasn't lying. And the truth, the truth ain't hating. You feel me? That's what the young kids say today, you know? So I stood up on mine, you know what I mean? And I wanted my shot. I felt like I had proven that I was one of the best at the time in the world. Uh, when you look at my amateur pedigree, I, I don't know how they didn't see me coming, but, um, that's neither here nor there. I wanted my time. I got tired of waiting. And after I knocked out Eric Harden in the rematch, I had, you know, I became, you know, a full fighter with experience. I had gone through my trials and tribulations. I had overcame defeat. And I felt like at that time, there was no light heavyweight in the world that, that could beat me. And uh, I think when it was my time to prove that, I think I did. And, you know, whatever the circumstances or however you want to, say it i mean we had a fight he had just amount the same amount of time to get ready as i did uh i think i showed in the first fight that i was more than capable um but after i felt like i was robbed there was nothing else for me to do but take it out of the judge's hand and steve you are my witness you know i told everyone that would listen what would ha what i was planning on doing in the second fight so you know you know, people can say it was a fluke or whatever. I trusted that I did the work and I believed in myself and I rolled the dice by saying, you know, what's your excuse tonight, Roy? And I felt at that time, man, I was going to go out on my shield. And, you know, I think I prepared for what happened. Um, you know, one shot, perfect time, counter shot. You know, and I knocked out one of the greatest fighters of all time. And uh, I don't I don't care where you you know, where he, it was before and after me that things changed, you know, and I ain't saying nothing, but when you fight a man at 13 years old and you fight him toe to toe and you give him one of his toughest fights in his little young amateur career, knowing that he had Roy senior and he was more experienced than me right there, bro. I knew I belong, you know, and when I went and represented the country and was one of the most decorated amateurs of all time in the history of the sport. And when you look at how I beat every man ranked above me to get the Roy, bro, I, I don't want to hear that. I, Cause nobody gave me nothing, bro. You feel me? I, I was man enough to stand on 10 and I beat the man. So, you know what I'm saying? And I'm going to tell you, if I wouldn't have beat Roy, nobody wasn't beating Roy, nobody. And I don't care what the hell going on right now today. And if people think that, they lying to themselves. If I wouldn't have beat Roy Jones, nobody in the world would have beat Roy Jones like that. I was the only man could do it. And I knew that when I was 13 years old. And I trusted the process. I worked my ass off. Nobody gave me nothing. I, you know what I mean? And still today, you know, sometimes I think that was, you know, that because people really never really said, gave me my credit. They made an excuse for everything. But when you get out of the game, 23 years, you fight all the killers and you look like this. That's success, bro. Could nobody put no, could nobody put no gloves on me. And they know that. Man, let me tell you something. I, I knew you obviously had the skill set, mad respect. But ironically, we were talking about trying to get that fight. It was your personality and your gumption that you said got the fight. But it was one of those fights to go back, uh, Antonio, where like, I'll never forget. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those yeah. fights. Like, I remember where I was. I remember there was something on Twitter that was trending a little while ago. Um, 
knockouts that you'll never forget right or something like that and that was one of the first knockouts that came to mind i remember so it wasn't jane 80 the referee yeah. Shit, yeah. Remember the second fight yeah i remember that and when and then i remember when he said when you said you got any questions and you said oh you got an excuse then he goes not questions like yeah, that or said, come on, come on, not any questions <laughs> like that and then you proceeded to do that i go oh damn that dude is, i said it was just so in boy hold on it was just so impressive and i was like wow you you hardly ever see a guy be able to call a shot, call his shot in boxing, talk the talk, and then walk the walk and deliver. And against the level of opponent of caliber like Roy Jones, whoa, that was so you'll always get tip of the hat, mad respect for me, man. But it was one of those like you never forget it. Being you, see, there, you know what I'm saying? Roy's yeah. body seemed to go in slow motion. Like it was surreal to actually see that. And then and this guy starts doing a victory lap around the ring because he knew he was out. What round was that again? Second. Said, yeah. The second round. I, I, I remember that definitely like, tripped me out because I remember it was early. I was like, wait, what? Antonio, <laughs> could you see that shot in slow motion? Like, take us through that sequence. Hey, you know what, Steve? It was it was a shot that I missed him with about seven, about eight seconds before that. Mm -hmm. I felt that would have really you know, did the damage that, that, that shot. So I was gunning for him, bro. I wasn't going to no decision. I was sitting down on those punches and I was punching with Roy. And that was the risk that I took punching with Roy Jones, but buddy McGirt trained me, man. And we, and I gambled. It was a gamble that I took. You feel me? And so these are the, the risks that fighters have to take in that yeah. ring. You can't have no fear, bro. And, and so when I prepared and I trusted, I mean, hey, Buddy lit that fire, though. Buddy, you Tony, know where Buddy, Antonio, Buddy, I, Buddy, I asked about I that. Me some Buddy. Buddy actually Buddy's said cool. Eddie Futch gave him some advice. He said, before you go into this fight, I want you to know one thing: there's never been a fighter in the history of boxing that can block and throw punches at the same time. So you're gonna have to put Roy on the defensive. So Antonio, I always got the sense you were crazy enough to actually think you could beat Roy Jones because guys were defeated before they ever got into it with him. Yeah, they were in awe. So you're telling me that your fight at age 13, you had it in your mind. You know what? I can handle this. Well, you know, it actually started out like it was uh, Roy in inspired me, bro. Because at the time, you know, after seeing Roy Jones in 88, you know, my life had took a different spin. I was on another whole road. You feel me? So witnessing that at that moment, the light bulb went off for me. I knew exactly my purpose for everything that I was trying to do. And I knew it was in that ring. And I knew, I'm like, man, because I'll never forget how competitive that fight was. And I said, if, if this man can be right here in Seoul, Korea, I know what my purpose in life was to box and be the best champion I could be. Never knowing that that same guy would one day meet, we would one day meet again. I never knew that. I couldn't see that far ahead. But when I became the number one guy in the Olympics in the country and then internationally, the number one light heavyweight in the world, beating the Cubans, the Germans, the Russians, all of them. You feel me? I knew then that I was going to be light heavyweight. Roy Jones was campaigning at light heavyweight. So in my mind, already I was preparing to conquer whoever was in my way. It just happened to be Roy Jones to make that story much better, but it could have been Sugar Ray Leonard. I was going to approach it the same way. Yeah, got you you. I, lo I love it. I love it. I man. was coming through no matter what, bro, because that was my goal and dream, and that was my promise to the from from God. So, and when you have that type of talent and skill, and that type of knowledge of the game, and you got to understand, I was blessed with some of the best trainers and coaches since I was ten years old in the game. See. I had the experience already. Right. You know it wasn't I mean? something you, you hadn't seen before. They're, 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 they weren't throwing uh, you looks. You've seen it all at that point. No, you know what? I was an exceptional fighter at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. I was one of the best. You understand me? I wasn't just no, I was a standout even at that young age. So when I got out of boxing, you feel me? All of this could have happened earlier. But when I got out of boxing, that's why I say God don't make no mistakes. I had to go through what I had to go through in order to prepare myself for what it was that I was coming to, you know, face in boxing with all of everything I had to face, you know, the politics, yeah, yeah. you know, having to deal with a lot of things, bruh. And it, it was just me. 
It wasn't like I had no big team behind me. It was just me. So, and when you look at what I was able to accomplish, that in itself speaks volumes because we know you damn near have to be connected to get anywhere in boxing. Right. You almost have to be connected. Well, I never had those connections. I just had these two fists. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Last question for me, Antonio, because I'm just because you mentioned um, being so young and recognized. I mean, obviously, you, you, you had the talent since you were young. How much do you give, just generally speaking, from all this, to these fighters credit to natural born ability or how much can you actually improve if you just work on the craft? If it's not as natural, can you ever get to the level of a guy who maybe has the natural born talent or does it all come down at the end of the day to the focus, the dedication, the discipline? Definitely the focus, dedication, and discipline. But if you have a trainer, a teacher now that can huh. teach the skill set. That's him. Okay. I mean, that's the key. That's it's the just, key, right? Okay. Hey, Mario, there's levels to this when I say teaching. Yeah. Bruh, I can demonstrate and show exactly what I'm trying to teach the fight. You feel me? And so my thing is, my experiences allow me to break that fighter down. I know how to beat this fighter. You understand? So come back here. Let me give you the game plan. Let me show you the technique. Let me show you the skill set that you're going to need to combat this fighter. Now, if that fighter has talent and skill already, then the sky is the limit. We can prepare to beat anyone. But a lot of times, fighters have to be motivated. Hmm. Fight fighters have to believe. You feel me? And that's where... I come in at, you know, I make fighters believe in things they can't really see because it's repetition, bro. And when you do things enough, it becomes a habit. You know what I mean? But this thought process has never changed, bro. It's like, so it's an ongoing thing. Every day I wake up trying to be a better me. You understand? Even though I may not be, I might not be training every day. Still, I'm trying to do something better than I did the day before. Well, Antonio, let's get into this. We had a conversation late last week as we're setting up this interview. One of the things that has disappointed him is that with his vast wealth of knowledge and his experience, and he wants to be in the gym, Antonio, it has disappointed you that more young fighters have not reached out to you because you do want to start being more or less a world-class trainer. How do you begin that process then? Well, I'm already training my son, bro, and my son ain't never had no amateur background pedigree so you can see his skill set you, you understand that's i'm a i'm a born teacher i've always been a leader in every facet of the game and you know I, I have a way of communicating that i know how to speak that language you understand so i'm not saying i'm better than no one i'm just different and it ain't gonna take but one fighter to come and i'm gonna be able to prove that i can move that needle bro mm -hmm. Give the fighters my experience. And I don't think, you know, when you talk about big moments and big times in the fight, bro, I don't know who else they would want in their corner, bro. And I'm more I'm more effective between rounds. You got me because, fired up right now. <laughs> hey, I can, hey, Mario, I'm going to tell you, I can see this shit before it happened, for real. For real. Just yeah. with my just with my anticipation. With my instincts. Of course. I can call a fight and I can I can pretty much tell you by the what I'm looking at. I can see what's about to happen. That's just my gift and my my vision. But yeah, these young fighters should it don't take but two weeks. I can show them the difference. It ain't gonna take but two weeks. So you there it is. So any young hopeful prospects out there that are in need of a teacher, not just a I trainer. To, hey, hey, we need to talk to the managers and them promoters that want to see their fighter win. They got to get them lessons, man. And yeah. just, just, just try me, bro. Where's and home I'm at these days, Antonio? You need a you need a trainer and a teacher that's been consistent. I've yes. been consistent in the game of boxing. I got C's in the sport. I ain't going nowhere. You feel me? I'm here to stay. So, yeah, this ain't no fly by night. And I'm not in this for no money, bro. I love the sport. No, I, I love can, the sport. You can see the passion. I was just curious. Where, where, where's home at these days? I'm in Tampa, man. Tampa, okay. Florida. Yeah. All right. All no, right. But, they're, but they have a nice airport. Uh, yes. Why? Hey, Tampa's anyway, a fun town. <laughs> Antonio, always a pleasure to talk to you. Let's do this again soon. We really appreciate your time. Hey, nice talking to you, my guy. You know where we all started from, bro. <laughs> all I right. Came in the game, Steve. <laughs> all right. Hey, Antonio, I'm going to be in Tampa 
in September. I'm going to hit you up. We're going to work up. out. <laughs> All right. Don't make that. You got me fired up. I'm going to work out. Hey, I, will give them, I will give them the digits. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. And we'll be back. More three knockdown rule after these messages. We're back on the three knockdown rule. Antonio Tarver, always a very talkative, informative session with him. Thank you to the magic man, folks. I love it, me some Antonio Tarver. He's oh, cool. who doesn't? I mean, I, I hope he gets a big time broadcasting gig soon. He is sorely missed He's in great. my view. I want to train with him. <laughs> You'll do it. You will have his number. All right, folks, we just want to remind you, if you'd like to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our fine program, we still have some slots available. Please reach out to us by emailing info at boxbid.io. Once again, that's info at boxbid.io. Boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon. It helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships. We are proudly working with boxbid.io. Review preview. On to the fight review, fight preview. Uh, interesting weekend here in Japan for Joshua <laughs> Franco, a young man I covered his whole career. Not only did he come in six pounds overweight for his title fight, mm. he then announced his retirement after losing to Kazuko Ioka and for the WBA 115-pound title. I don't know if it's a hiatus or not. Young fighters are now seemingly having issues. Good luck to Mr. Franco uh, in the next phase of his life, if it indeed is the end. Moving on to the fight preview. Toledo, Ohio on ESPN. Uh, show brought to you by Top Rank, a heavyweight feature. Jared, the real Big Baby Anderson, takes on late replacement Charles Martin. Mario, I think Big Baby Anderson, I'm going to say something here. And again, um, this is in terms of where he is at the stage of his career and the number of fights. He's the best, most natural heavyweight I've seen since Riddick Big Daddy Bo. That doesn't mean that he's going to have as many title defenses or the type run of Deontay Wilder, who was more of a project that exceeded expectations. But Mario, when I look at Anderson, I see a big guy who just happens to be a big athlete but was first and foremost a boxer. Power in both hands, the ability to switch shit, boxing acumen, Upper body movement. I could be wrong. I could be eating my words. I think he has it. I really like what I see, too. And coming off of what Antonio Tarver just said, too, does he have the focus, the dedication, and the discipline? And if he does, considering the landscape and heavyweight division right now, some of these guys are getting a little long in the tooth. He's, it's, the time could be his if he navigates these waters. Mario, I remember asking him three years ago. I got to talk to him a lot during the bubble era of boxing and so i interviewed him a few times and i asked him you know you're a big guy from toledo ohio and this is a hometown thing but i asked him what other sports did you play and i'm thinking basketball football i said steve i've only boxed i said wait a minute you've never played any it was nothing organized it. so that's the difference unlike a lot of our other heavyweights of the past generation they don't grow three inches to become a power forward football they get injured no no he was a boxer first and foremost and i think that is a huge advantage it really shows too when you're in the trenches and in certain competitive fights and when you start to step it up with caliber of fighter uh you can tell the guys who have been doing it yeah and just the natural fluidity and his ability to slip and counter and there's all then switch hitting how many how many heavyweights at 6'4", 240 can do that seamlessly. Well, that's that's experience right yeah, there. And then his ability to breathe and relax, mm -hmm. I think it's very, very rare. And if he can catch, mm. I, I think he's going to be very, yeah. very tough to beat in mm -hmm. the near future. Also, from Manchester, England, Franchon Cruz does earn defense her Super Middleweight Championship against Savannah Marshall. Then on from Sheffield, England, on the zone, Dalton Smith takes on Sam Maxwell. News and notes. Also... Uh, moving on to news and notes. I like this fight. I know it's small guys, but hey, you know what? Small guys need love too. Bam versus Sonny. 
Jesse Bam Rodriguez takes on Sonny Edwards in a WBO slash IBF flyweight title fight. Date and venue to soon be announced. Mm. Nice fight there TBD. Uh, put together by, uh, by Eddie Hearn. Mario, you know one fight that you talked about that I don't think is going to happen? Even though late last week, Samson Lekowitz, the promoter of Benavides, oh yeah, told Dan Raphael, yeah, we're going to fight Morel. Mm. We're going to fight Morel. But then a day later, David Benavides said, well, I, I don't know anything about this. And then hell hath no fury like David Morrell scorned. This is what he uh, put in a press release. I, I didn't know he knew this much English or was this talkative. He said, David Benavides is a big bitch. Uh-oh. His dad is a big fraud, always talking like he's some tough guy, but he's a small man with little man complex. His brother wants to be a gangster who talks a lot of shh, but gets knocked out by Crawford uh, and did a horrible job in the movie Creed. Wow, a movie uh, <laughs> wow. review, too. Taking a uh, personal uh, The Benavideses uh, are a bunch of cowards. Uh, this is a guy you call the Mexican monster. He's a fraud. Whoa. This is the guy everyone is building up. I see a fat, insecure boy. That's what I see. Benavides couldn't walk down any street in Cuba without getting his shoes taken. Funny, he calls Canelo, Canelo a duck. Who's the duck now? It, it's ironic how we were talking about Tarver having that um, Mr. T Clubber Lang moment in Rocky. Yeah, I mean, well, that was prior <laughs> to social media. Now they're kind of having these moments, or somebody's writing them for him um, on social media. Will it get him the fight? Well, obviously not the next one. Maybe down the line. I, I is it Benavides uh, may not want to risk. I, I, we were talking earlier about may want to not risk with such a dangerous opponent with Canelo looming in the future because Morel is a dangerous opponent. Mario, if you were David Benavides, would you face someone that's nine to zero? Be honest, honestly, because when I saw Morel, well, it depends. Is it the better BF sort of nine and zero? When I see a yes, better BF, uh, well, you know what I mean. That's what I'm saying. It me, depends on what. Let me just say this: when you were there in Vegas, and I don't know if you were there in the venue because it looked pretty empty when Morel blew out Falcao. No, I saw it. I just said, no, he's dangerous. Because what happened was after he beat Kayla Plant, Benavides, his people are saying, "Oh yeah, we're going to take on Morel." I'm thinking that's the very definition of risk versus reward. And I'm thinking to myself, are you sure that's really what we're going to do at nine and zero? And I have to tell you, he's a Cuban. He ain't a Rigando Cuban. No, he's no, no. big. He's, he's got solid. Hands. He's strong. He's aggressive. He's kind of everything. He, he he's not someone you want to face when you've got the biggest payday possibly looming, which I think will be inevitable. I'd like to think that it will be inevitable. So I'm not trying to have any part of Morel. Up until then. Yeah, by the way, I'm told that David Morrell, despite all those words, has great respect for Benavides and his family. All right, moving on to the Ask Mario segment of this program. Here's one from uh, at EF, uh, EB Man or Anna. Ask Mario, who is his one to watch? One that he thinks is going to be a star, but is early in his career or currently unknown, etc. You named him earlier. I think he's definitely one of them. Um, the youngest son of Fernando Vargas. Emiliano Vargas. I think the kid looks really special, and, and uh, he seems focused and disciplined and has the package where he's a good-looking kid. Could be sort of like what we thought Ryan Garcia might be as far as along those lines with marketability and talent. Um, so far, so good. Ironically, Dave Morrell, who's only got nine fights. Right. And I, he seems... I, well, to me, he's he's now a contender. He is, but when do you talk about contenders under 10 fights? Yes, I, that's the thing, but he's being that's moved to the Autobahn, not just the fast lane. Still, the ten, other, still under 10 fights? Look, I think Top Rank has an unbelievable roster. Bruce Shushu Carrington, mm -hmm. sharp little featherweight. Yeah, well, hard, uh, uh, Abdullah yeah. Mason, who I believe fights in Toledo on the undercard. He will be a world champion. Only 18. Uh, Tiger Johnson. Here's a, here's a local kid that I like out of L.A., big, heavy-handed guy. Kind of reminds me of a baby Benavides, Diego Pacheco, mm -hmm. I think is a real prospect. Mm -hmm. But it, it's interesting. When I look at the roster of Top Frank with guys like Keyshawn Davis, I just say, wow, there's a lot of talent there. Yeah, In fact, Jared Anderson used to be, but he's graduated. Mm -hmm. I think he's a top 10 heavyweight now, even at this stage. Here's a question from Four Corners Boxing. Is Virgil Ortiz versus Stanionis or Imanta Stanionis the best fight in boxing in the month of July, given that they may be closer to their primes? Now, it's still Crawford Spence. Come on. Oh, no, not, of course, let's, of course. Let's not overcome. Look, no. at the end of the day, could we quibble and say that fight should have happened a year or two earlier? Maybe. But the last I checked, 
Both guys are in the top four in the Ring Magazine pound for pound, are number one and two in the division, are undefeated. There's not a fight you can make realistically within a division that has that type of accolades. Ortiz Stanionis is an excellent fight, but I don't see it uh, really having the stakes or the historical value of that fight. Here's one from your favorite guy, the Fanny Merchant, the only Sanchez. Ask that Sandra Bullock facial routine user Mario Lopez. Did he Sandra ever think Bullock. Jaime Munguia <laughs> would be the second cash cow of 168 the way Berlanga and Benavidez are calling him out? It's interesting. Oscar <laughs> actually said, I've spoken to Munguia. He wants Benavidez. Are you sure? Are we really sure he wants Benavidez? I, I, I'm yeah. I'm surprised only because I, I, I would take. I don't. I think he would like Benavidez. I don't know if he'd want him next. I would rather take the Belenga fight, possibly build it up, and then maybe fight Benavidez after that, or even possibly a Charlo brother if that would to surface. But I, I don't think he'd be opposed to fighting him. I don't know about next though. I don't either. I, I don't think next. I mean, if you're, <laughs> if you're De La Hoya, you've kind of babysat him. You babysat him. And they're like, okay, Benavides. I'm like, well, no, wait no, a minute. No, you no, can't, you can't jump right on the freeway when right. you've just been driving in the parking lot. Right. You've got to go around the neighborhood a couple times. Yes, let's go around the cul-de-sac. <laughs> let's go to the yeah, let's yeah, take yeah, yeah. The local supermarket. Right, you're right. not going on the Autobahn. I just, it's, it doesn't have to be all or nothing no, no, here. No, no, right, right, right. Not that, uh, not that big of a jump. And look, the, the Berlanga fight, there's danger because that guy can bang for all his flaws. If he gets hit with the same shots he did against Derry Vachenko, mm, that's bad news. There's a chance he doesn't survive mm -hmm. like he did with round five. Agreed. So let's be honest about it final flurries final flurries mario within a couple of months people will be able to step on you in hollywood well actually a little bit longer thank <laughs> you i assume you're talking about the the, the announcement of, of the Getting star star. And the walk of fame yeah that's kind of cool it hasn't really hit in i mean hit hit me yet but um uh, i'm gonna be class of 2024 uh i'll be 50 when that happens and the hollywood sign will be turning 100 years old <laughs> So we're Whoa. roughly about the same age, Hollywood sign and I. And uh, yeah, man, that's going to be there forever. So my kids, my grandkids will all get to see it. And uh, 40 years in this business, believe it or not. So that's, uh, I'm kind of a loss for words, but I appreciate, thanks to the Chamber of Commerce in Hollywood, and I appreciate the honor. Mario, when they give you that honor and it's official, is it? Something you have to do to go there to that day. Because I usually, they have press junkets, right? Don't they have like a big press thing and all the fans yeah, show up? Yeah, but the up? actual ceremony, yeah. They'll, I think they're going to give me a date. Um, I think they said spring uh, around uh, this next year. And then, yeah, you, you're are you going to be there, fool, or what? Uh, I'll have my what people you, call your people. You mean, uh, Here's the you other. You got any other friends? Uh, well don't don't, don't flatter yourself. I got at least three, and they're all above you. Uh, anyway, yeah, no. Right. Here's another, can you choose where your star is, or is just no? Like, you can't choose your star. I, I want to be next to the Man Theater, not no, so no, close I to can't. Hollywood Boulevard. Don't put me on Yucca Street. Well, <laughs> yeah, <what laughs> who, who knows? No, hey, I'm I'm honored. I'll I'll go wherever, and you know, mom and dad are fired up, so I'm happy. You know, not bad for a Mexican kid from Chula Vista. Oh, uh, Other thing, <laughs> uh, Mario, what a buzzkill! I thought we were getting. Musk versus Zuckerberg. Say it ain't so. I knew Elon what Musk happened? was trolling the what whole happened, time. Man. That was hilarious. And I was talking to Data and he swore it was there. I go, come on. I go, Elon Musk doesn't even like to work out. He says he just likes to lipo whenever he feels he's getting the chest. <laughs> By the way, my guy's a big dude. He's like 6'3 and two something, and Zuckerberg's coming in maybe a buck fifty. So I don't know what the weight <laughs> difference would have been right there, but I knew he was trolling the whole time. Listen, on a serious note, I do love that Zuckerberg training. Is training, Sparring, loves jujitsu. This is a guy who could be participating in country club activities, golf, tennis. He's choosing to get choked out, beat up. It's a tough physical sport in jujitsu. It's humbling. And the fact that he is raising the awareness level and putting it out there, tip of the hat to him, man. I, I, I think it's awesome. You know who works awesome. out a lot? And I'm impressed. RFK Jr. Yo, <laughs> dude. I had no idea that was going on. On the, my guy, look, forget sixty nine. He looks incredible for sixty nine. He looks fantastic for twenty nine. He, I, I, I had no idea that was going on. I heard he's doing the bow flex, dude. He's doing something <laughs> because he was at Venice Beach, old school Arnold. Oh, by the way, have you seen the Arnold documentary? Yes, I have. I saw it. I told you about it. Oh, I've got the one more episode to go. Well, let's talk about yeah. it next week because the one yeah. I've got the third episode to go because that's a whole other thing. But anyway, he was down there. Forget the, the politics aside. I'm just talking about the individual. That dude looks incredible. He should be our health director. He's about Let's to be, be 70 years old. 
tan like the mitts on him with the forearms in the I was like, yo, that was inspirational. Handsome guy. Yes. He sounds like Don Corleone, the poor guy, and that's due to an accident <laughs> that he had, you know, because yeah. you've heard him speak and stuff. But man, that was a that's an impressive individual. And I was he like, seems All to right. do a lot of body weight. Like he's not lifting too much, but he seems to do a lot of push ups, pull ups. I'm like, wow. He's like salute. Have you ever seen Lou Gehrig back in the day? Yes. Where way that guy was built. He's kind of like one of those natural Lou Gehrig kind of because Lou Gehrig back in the day was a my guy was just a, a just a, a, a just an oak. Just looked and how did you you didn't yeah. see physiques like that yeah. back in uh, what was that the the forties? Well, there's no doubt. The, I, I you think didn't growing, see, so I'm thinking he seems like of that era. No, I I know what happened as a kid. He actually got those Joe Weider brochures he must have saved up a couple bucks and done, done some stuff there. he's done whatever he's doing he's doing salute right. salute to you yeah, rfk yeah, jr exactly all right before we wrap it up here we just want to remind you again if you want to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our fine program we still have slots available please reach out to us by emailing info at boxbid.io once again that's info at boxbid.io boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon that helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships we are proudly working with boxbid.io so on behalf of mario lopez smoking tim frazier and tino this is steve kim saying till the next round goodbye everybody